I'm Kristen Kelsey. I'm an interior architect and I currently lead uh, inside at Signal, an interior practice that's within the architecture and research firm here in Seattle. Um, I'm so honored and excited to be here this morning with um, Clayton and Anne and all of you. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers and then turn it over to them. And at the end, we'll have the opportunity to um, hear questions and conversation with the students that have been able to uh, join us this morning. So um, Clayton um, is an architect and co-founder of the and principal at West of West, an architecture and design studio located in Portland. The practice focuses on design forward projects that involve creating ground up buildings, large scale interiors and reuse of outdated structures. Clayton guides the firm towards creating meaningful relationships between people and the built environment through thoughtful spatial compositions and bespoke material arrangements. Before West of West, Clayton Taylor worked as an associate at Rios and as a project designer for Morphosis, both in Los Angeles. Clayton received an MARC from UCLA and a BARC from Cal Poly at St. Louis Obispo. He's a member of the AIA and NCARB certified architect with licensure in California, Oregon, Washington, and Texas. Um, it's been a pleasure to get to know you, Clayton. So I'm really excited to hear from you today. And then uh, we also have uh, Anne Cunningham. She has joined the Department of Architecture this fall as the Margot Grant Walsh visiting professor and is teaching an interior architecture studio. Anne, who is based in Seattle, has more than 30 years of experience in the design field. She was a design principal at NBBJ Architects for more than 27 years, and in 2009 left to start her own consulting practice, Tarpaulin Studio, where she currently works on civic and mixed use projects in the Seattle area. Throughout her career, she has worked on projects for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Boeing, Microsoft, and Vulcan. I have personally known of Anne's work and have always really been inspired by her care, thoughtfulness, and human-centered spatial solutions. Um, I am so pleased to have you both here. And um, without further ado, I think I'll turn it over to Clayton to start us off. Yeah, so um, very excited to kind of talk through some of this stuff. Um, also excited about the, the prompt uh, th that kind of ties all this together really well. So um, just a little bit about us. We're, we're a small design practice in Portland. Um, uh, we have another small branch in, in Los Angeles as well. Um, the firm is founded by myself and, and Jai Kamaran almost five years ago now. Um, and we focus a lot on building, interior, and and reposition or renovation projects. Um, a lot of it has to do with the commercial office uh, world a little bit. Um, and then uh, kind of a whole range of other things that, that fall out of that um, and revolve around that. Um, so pr predominantly the practice is commercial um, and intent and then has uh, a, a wide mix of interior and exterior work. Um, kind of where we're at right now, the, the company is uh, a small company kind of constantly rethinking our identity and what, what we're up to as we as we kind of grow in, into the you know the world a bit more. Um, I think John and I talked a little bit about this before the, this lecture and kind of analyzing where we're at now. Um, you know we're at we're kind of at the intersection of a kind of a, a, a bunch of kind of messy projects and then a, a bunch of projects that are really about solving problems. So I think we are excited uh, that our practice is kind of forming an agenda, but also kind of in the mix of a lot of different things. Um, and so what you're seeing today is, is us putting it together um, kind of under one, under one framework that that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, the, the, the lecture today and, and the talk today, you know, I really tried to take the prompt um, that Aaron and, and Justin put together and, and think about this idea of threshold and sort of rewrapped a series of our projects around that, um, looking at different ways that our work is kind of engaged um, some of these topics over the years. I think the, the public in general has been a constant thing that our practice is, is challenged with, um, both in the smaller work that we did earlier on and then the kind of larger building 
stuff that we uh, are involved in now. Um, so I, I sort of rewrapped each kind of chapter of our of our work around that 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 uh, topic a little bit. So I'll try to introduce the topic um, in relation to the topic and also talk about the work simultaneously. Um, again, hopefully that we get kind of a, a rich discussion out of all this stuff and kind of try to tie it all together at the end. So um, first few projects is a collection of retail experiments that that kicked off our practice um, a few years back. Um, around this idea of texture as engagement. Um, we started doing a lot of retail projects that were exciting for us because it put us in front of the public, uh, basically creating public spaces, uh, but in, in the thousand square foot, 500 square foot at a time increment. Um, and really we're working with smaller brands that it was the first time they had, a, they had the chance to kind of interact with the public as well in a physical space. So a lot of these projects came down to looking at how do you really engage with someone as they come in a store or, or have that public experience with the brand and really tried to find a way to make that interesting. And a lot of them came down to inventing texture, inventing a material um, expression uh, that was more or less, you know, visceral or you can kind of feel uh, what, that, what that would be about. So the first one was a store we did for Garrett Light, California Optical. This is their first of five stores we did for them. Uh, where they came to us and it was, you know, hey, we have this great California-based eyewear brand. Uh, we don't know what that's like in real space. Um, and that was kind of a great challenge for us. Um, and they took a, a lease of space on La Brea, which, which is a pretty car-centric street um, in LA. And we, we talked with them about creating this kind of interior billboard for them, um, for their product. So um, in this situation, uh, a lot of the, the store was developed around this peg wall system and this kind of uh, white ribbon that wraps around the room. Um, again, both looking at how does someone walk up and touch, touch the wall and engage in the product, uh, but also how does that display an overall effect within uh, the space itself and then translate out to the street as well. So there was this kind of draw of bringing people in um, and getting them to actually get up to the wall and see something and, and kind of engage in it. So that textural level um, of invention was really well received by them and it's something that they kind of carried forward. Um, this is that wall unraveled. Um, so that whole wall system, the top part is, is closer to the, uh, the visitor and the lower part is pushed in, uh, creating this kind of ribbon that, that offsets the geometry and then that textural approach of uh, putting pegs across the wall and allowing this, this kind of intermixing of, of product and, and people and, and kind of rearranging that wall. Um, and it was the first project we did and we built um, as a small practice. So it was an exciting, uh, exciting moment where we, you know, we're going to build this one store. And it's going to change the world, you know, that kind of thing. So it was, uh, it was, it was a really uh, great experiment for us. And and I think we treated the following few uh, retail projects in the same vein, um, where, you know, it's, it's a very small controlled area, and uh, it's about how much can we really pack into a tiny little spot um, and and get the most out of it. The second one we had done for them was in New York, um, which was a real real change in, in you know, a uh, LA brand going to New York and trying to make a splash. So a lot of this was going back to that textural idea and saying, how do we bring something that's warm and from Venice basically um, to New York? And that became all about plywood and reinventing plywood and how elegant it can be. Um, so again, on the left, you're getting this, this textural uh, wall system built out of edge ply, just stacked up and, and pushed in relief uh, to create again, that engagement. Um, just just raw plywood uh, stacked and, and, and put in the store and, and lit well. And again, that, that was all about rolling uh, people through the store and having them uh, engage in different parts of, of what's going on there. So towards the front, there's a garden as you walk in and then the ribbon wraps around the room um, with the eyewear and, and different kind of touch moments around the space. So um, it, it, again, it was, it was taking some of the DNA we, we discovered with them in Los Angeles and sort of remix it and focus on the same aspects of how do you get people to walk in, feel welcomed, and to start to engage in the store and not just kind of look at it. So um, it's a big thing for us. The, the, the next one here is, is a, a shoe store we did in San Francisco, uh, which was all about this uh, double-sided perf folded wall. Um, one room's rust, one room's all black, one room's all white, and you kind of get this um, effect between the different perforated rooms. Um, again, we're just really leaning on creating a material 
and a textural exploration and then letting that kind of do its work throughout the store as much as we can. Um, and then there was these kind of totems of, of wood throughout the store uh, with pressure sensitive LED behind uh, the shoe. So you pick a shoe up and it would say nothing, but when you pick the shoe up, the pressure would release and it would display an LED behind the wood veneer. Um, again, it was all about like, go in, touch the shoes, engage in it, you know, like how do you uh, really make that experience memorable um, and, and something to grab onto. Um, this is kind of the store, they have an event space off to one side, but the store is a series of, of three galleries kind of sandwiched together uh, with this perforated wall system. Um, another, another take on that was uh, a lot of these, it's, it's basically finding that moment, this kind of small but mighty design move. Um, this one in particular was a, uh, uh, a whole ceiling system that starts to subdivide the space based on how it's carved up um, through these linear wood members. Um, the whole store itself is, is, is pretty basically, pretty basic, it's just one room with a column. So it was about how do you express that column and get it to connect to everything else um, and really lean on this kind of crafted uh, ceiling element uh, that diffuses the light and, and kind of helps play with uh, the spatial qualities of that space quite a bit. Um, this, is all, this is in Los Angeles for a, a group, group called Banks Journal. Um, kind of the final store was was an unbuilt one, but it was a pretty good attempt at trying to build a dispensary that had the same same uh, take on it where we were doing terrazzo. Uh, I think there's a, an obsession of terrazzo in our office and trying to find ways to get it to, to be everywhere. And this store really took it to the extreme where um, everything about it is is this edgeless terrazzo that wraps the whole space. Um, again, still playing with some of that uh, material quality and how it becomes spatialized. Um, yeah, and become something that's that's tied to the brand and tied to the experience as much as possible. Um, and we we learned a lot about these projects, um, and we still we still run through a lot of retail projects. And we I think we've just been treating them as experiments because it's 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 a room it's a area that we can really kind of iterate through pretty rapidly and create a lot of different stuff out of it. So that work kind of led to some larger commercial scale work where we took some of those same values, but kind of scaled up and then it started to change how we approach some of those things. And a lot of that was, was some uh, workplace or, or uh, larger office building uh, repositions, which is an interesting problem in and of itself. Um, so this is the a project we've been working on for about two and a half years here in Portland, um, which the, the core problem kind of become, became the, the basic inspiration for the whole project. Um, the Wells Fargo Tower is the tallest building in, in the state of Oregon. Uh, it's, it's long forgotten as big, big Pink usually tries to win that title, but technically Wells Fargo is taller. Uh, everybody that works in there, I think is kind of proud of that. Uh, but uh, over the years, it's kind of lost its, its grandeur a little bit. Um, it's, you know, we looked at it and, and tried to critically look at what the building wasn't doing and, and what's, what's missing there um, from like a really basic, uh, you know, uh, more pedestrian oriented level, which I don't think the tower was designed for as much, or it was kind of designed against the pedestrian. Um, so the tower itself sits on a parcel, it's pulled back from the street. There's a sunken moat around the tower, and then there's a little drawbridge that basically connects you to the tower. So if you think about this from a building that would be designed nowadays, you know, th this is completely turning its back on the pedestrian, pulled away from the street, fortified, protected. You know, it, it's a, it's, it's not in, in it's, it's, its main objective is to not engage with people. Um, so to try and look at that and say, how do we make this friendly and, and public again, was, was the main uh, premise of it. Um, again, that sunken moat kind of wrapping around it, but a lot of that came with, with reprogramming the tower. Um, I think we did about 100,000 feet of renovation, just looking at bike hub, market hall, you know, food, fitness, all this kind of stuff that comes into the mix um, of the lower part of the tower which is previously unused space and just trying to find a way to reuse it. Um, the biggest part about the tower though was if you're a pedestrian, you couldn't actually walk through it. Or if you had, if you had to enter the building, you had to go on one side and kind of go through a staircase around the corner and then up through the other side to get to the desk. So there was never this sort of free flow uh, pedestrian level to it. So uh, because of the grades in downtown Portland, the two entrances are split. Uh, so you can never actually walk through the tower. 
Um, and with security measures, you can't actually get from one to the next. So it was this whole confusing situation. Um, so we took that on as like the kind of biggest thing. If we could solve this problem and make a design uh, agenda out of it, I, I think that would be a success. And that, that's kind of where we drove the, the crux of the project. Um, so that came in with uh, removing part of the floor um, on, the, on the upper lobby and drawing a line to connect those two spaces um, with, with, a, with a big, uh, big impactful moment there. Um, the tower itself, uh, this is kind of referencing our, our, uh, our retail work a little bit, is this kind of pinstripe tower. So we were referencing how do you create a pattern language out of that, that tower piece? Um, also make it contemporary, but also relate to the history of the tower in a way. So this linear kind of movement of the tower and how it, how it stretches in um, what was our biggest inspiration. Um, looking at that ceiling piece that, that, that wraps around. So we were, were introducing a ceiling wall to stair component. Um, and then uh, the whole piece itself, you know, intersecting with an existing building is, is, is challenging in and of its, of its own right. So like having fire sprinklers and mechanical ventilation and all this stuff kind of penetrate through this big piece of casework, which is like the size of a house to begin with, uh, was an interesting but fun moment of, of making that, that matter. But again, we're, we basically kind of worked our way down to the point of the tower, like this is the thing that's gonna tie it all together. And this is where we're gonna make a move that can help bring people into the tower, help them flow through the tower, identify a moment within the building that is central, um, that really brings back on that connection and that tie to the pedestrian as much as you can. Um, this is kind of before uh, renovation. The stagecoach is still ex in existence. It's just in the back of the tower. So uh, it's, it's an original stagecoach, uh, part of the Wells Fargo Museum. Uh, but the space, it was uh, uh, a kind of walled off zone. And then we um, just got photos back actually last week, but um, so this is adding a, a coffee hub up, up in the left-hand side, the new security desk, and then that stair that drops down. And there are a big ceiling piece that ties uh, through um, from this level and drops down to the level below it. Um, so again, everything is kind of oriented around how you bring people into the building and then through the stair and then uh, to the other level that's, that's adjacent. I'm just looking at that new stair piece that kind of bends and reorients down to the, the market hall, which is below, which is still not quite open yet, but it's, it's pretty much done. Um, stair down below. So I'm, I'm just really focusing on that, that ceiling piece, but there was a whole number of other uh, really fun pieces in the project. Um, you know, the, the, the three vendor food hall and uh, tenant lounges and fitness centers and things like that. Um, those all added to the programming mix and support support the tenants of the building. But I think these these couple moves here, um, which allowed us to really open up those lower levels is what the building sort of dedicating back to the public and creating that that threshold moment. So, I, so when uh, the brief came across about this lecture, I was like, oh, it kind of relates to how we were how we were treating this um, situation. and. And it's something that worked from a design agenda for us. It's something that worked from the client's perspective, which was all about adding value to this older building. Um, so it, it was a very kind of relevant uh, thing that I think tied uh, the use and, and the, uh, the approach to the building kind of all, all around one, one big move. And, and um, yeah, it, was, it was really great to see that, that executed. Um, Another take on the threshold concept, this is kind of edging into some of the uh, ground up buildings that we've been doing. Um, an office of our size, we, we were kind of uh, engaged in smaller, again, it's sort of the small but mighty approach to some of these projects. Uh, so this is called Terrace is Threshold and it's this uh, ground up uh, project we're doing in Los Angeles. Um, it's all office, but it's not, um, kind of large scale office, it's, it's mainly like a boutique scale office. So we're trying to build a series of office suites that, that kind of all cluster together um, and really focusing on what makes that special versus you know, what makes it bigger and better than the next building next to it. It's more about how do you make this kind of refined piece um, as nice as it can be. Um, location wise, it's in, uh, it's in Hollywood. Um, it's, it's, kind of edging towards the hills quite a bit, um, just close to sunset. So 
It's got great views to the north and it's also an area that's really uh, has a lot of different office buildings going on. We're probably the the smallest new office building being made in, in Hollywood, I'd say, something like that. So it's it's kind of this uh, approach to a, a very pointed, uh, a pointed small scale project. Um, there's an existing building on the site that we're also using. Um, so a lot of our projects have to do with collaging onto old buildings or keeping as much context as we can and trying to relate it back into the rest of the mass of the building. I think that's something that we've, we've I think as a designer, you're like, oh man, I deal with this old building. Uh, but uh, we've taken on it as a challenge. It's become something that pops up in a lot of our projects now. But this existing brick building here is, is, is what we're keeping. And you'll see that track through on some of these images in just a second. Um, whole premise of the building is it's, it's adjacent to the Hollywood Hills. And it has this idea of building a, a, a series of stacked bungalows, small office suites that all have this connection to the outdoors. Um, so there's not just one roof deck, but everybody gets a roof deck and they terrace up the building. So all these analogies with the hills are, are very relevant. Also, it stares at the Hollywood Hills. That's like the, the view for the building. So um, a lot of that stuff was kind of part of what the goals of the site were. So we tried to unravel what that identity is more um, and what it's like to, to live and be in the hills a little bit, sort of in an abstract way and how that relates to a commercial office place. Um, so this one was, you know, looking at the ideas of a, a revolving door of privacy and discovery, um, sort of being hidden, but also finding interesting things. Um, and then this garden for everyone, um, which, which is, you know, how do you start to make a collection of kind of communal outdoor spaces, but make them privatized in a way. Um, so they look at one another, they have a relationship with one another. Um, so that's, it's kind of the two themes that, that kicked off based on the context. Um, and from there, it was about finding ways to deal with the old building and bring in these office suites um, onto, the, onto the parcel. So you sort of get this wild mix of uh, new and old coming together. Uh, but what you get is a lot of individual character created by each, each little parcel. So each uh, little box in its own roof deck relates to a different view of the Hollywood Hills. Um, so the orientation, again, playing with orientation of view, um, how you create that. So um, each terrace sort of becomes that, that threshold as it relates to the hills or as, as it relates to the public um, kind of walking by. Um, which uh, again, it, it's, it's, we set up a, a framework that was pretty loose and it allowed us to iterate and move all these pieces around. So um, I think the final form of it um, pulls lots of character from some of those studies we were doing. Um, so on the far right is the existing building, uh, which gets painted out. Um, and then as you, as you move to the left, that's all new um, with this kind of gradient of dark to light grays. Um, roof deck on every level with a slightly different orientation. And then they are all able to, to talk to one another. So you can kind of lean over the edge and talk to somebody. Um, and then the, there's a, a wood clad stair tower that wraps up uh, creating uh, basically trying to get people not to use the elevator and try to use the stairs more. Um, so outdoor space on this one, it's, it's outdoor circulation, it's um, outdoor is the amenity and that's, that's the primary focus of all the spaces. Um, so that way when you start to unravel the plan behind that, um, like the entire office block is, if, if that's your roof deck, the whole interior shifted towards that view and, and towards the hills. So again, it, it's a different approach than we've been challenged with on some of our other office projects where it's about how do you make it more general? This one's about how do you make it more and more specific um, to create those conditions that are, that are adding value to the project. So really reorient it, reorient, reorient it towards the view, uh, create each level differently, uh, try and find individual characters as you step up through the project. And you get a collection of little suites uh, rather than just kind of general spaces that stacks through. Um, so again, it, it was an interesting problem for us and it's something that I think we learned a lot from and we roll into to how we think about some of these projects now. Um, again, the, the, the terraces are all kind of their own, their own language that stack up through the project. Um, and we found that there's, like I was saying, there's kind of a great connection as you're on one balcony, seeing someone walk up the steps to, to their office suite, trying to create what we hope happens is, is sort of that, that community that's in the building that's usually hidden behind a corridor. 
Um, so can you see someone walk up their suite and say hi for the day? Or can you be on your deck and there's someone next to you and there's a little bit of a connection there? Um, I think that that's kind of been in discussion is how private is a private roof deck and how communal can it be? Um, yeah, I, I think the outdoor space is, gains a lot of value uh, from, the, from the client standpoint when it is privatized, but how do you actually make it, you know, not just a, a secret spot, but something that's kind of uh, vital to the character of the building and, and the inhabitants of it a little bit. Um, so if I can get this, to, this is just a short kind of playthrough of it. Um, showing where it's at in, in Hollywood and stuff like that. Drive entrance and the concierge desk here. Just coming up through that kind of day walk, we hope that people take <laughs> the view out towards uh, the rest of Hollywood. You kind of see the existing building on the right. Yeah, so we've, we've been on this for about 18 months and paused for a second, but we got a, a list of bidders uh, of, of, uh, from the contractor um, a couple weeks ago. So we're fully permitted and we're, we're ready to go out to bid and excited to hopefully start construction, um, you know, January, February. Um, but it'll be one of the, there's other CLT projects going on in, in LA for sure, but it, it's a uh, CLT project with steel structure. So it's, it's got a little bit of uh, some of what we're seeing in Portland actually start to happen in LA, which is very exciting as well. I think that heavy timber market here and how that's working is really uh, such an amazing thing. So it's, it's really great to see that start to happen in other places where people are respecting um, uh, heavy timber construction and, and all the benefits that come with it. So that's kind of a, another narrative that's in the project as well. Um, the last project is kind of the freshest thing that we've been working on um, since the pandemic started. We, we took, we, we try to maintain our optimist side and, and look at challenges and, and try to find a way to, to move past them a little bit um, and, and put our heads together and work. So this, this one is something that our studio has been working on for a little while. Um, uh, reframing the, the workplace, which is um, the project's called Open Office, and it's trying to, to try and uh, come up with a post-pandemic solution um, for office place design. I think a lot of people are doing this. We wanted to um, find our, our position within some of this work. Um, and I think for us, it's looking at shifts in workplace culture more, not, not just pandemic-driven things, but um, cultural moments that, that the pandemic has accelerated, like work from home or how we collaborate um, and find, find those shifts and find those as inspiration moments rather than um, you know, putting Flexibex everywhere in, in a workspace. I think it's trying to really see what are the things that are gonna stay um, within uh, a post-pandemic situation and, and how is the office gonna shift and change because of that. Um, we, we did some images in a, in a, in a project um, that was part of this frame magazine discussion um, titled or the, the art the discussion was kind of about the post pandemic uh, office not being dead but actually a distributed uh, uh, feature so how does that office uh, take place in the city as a more of a distributed workforce being work from home or work next to home or work in the city center um, and it kind of evolved into the the headquarter office, what does that actually become when you remove components of it and put them elsewhere in the city? Um, and I, I think the, the employee choice is, is something that hopefully it doesn't go away and people having the, the comfort and ability to shift and, and create their workday in different places is really exciting. Uh, but I, I think the, you kind of turn your head back to what happens to the office when everyone's not there or there's other things happening uh, going on. So we, we, we tried to look at that premise and looked at a, a kind of a typical scenario of an old warehouse that they're going to turn into an office project. Um, 
But we, we really stressed uh, what's the office become when all of the essentially open office or the, the uh, you know, kind of desk uh, zones are all removed. Um, and, and in our, our understanding, basically what's left is the culture of the office and how do you support that and champion that. So if you removed everyone and allowed them to kind of do their work at home, but they actually came here as a safe place to collaborate or a place to experience their own workplace culture or a place to have lectures, um, but really changing the, the central office as kind of a place, a hub uh, for people to really, you know, uh, have something special that, that ties them together. Um, and and what, would, what would that become? Um, we also looked at other elements that I think add to that um, or creating a place that you wanna be that is different than a typical work environment. So it's got, it has lots of light. There's lots of connection to the outdoors. Um, there's ways to collaborate in, in, that, are, that are much more freeform. Um, and it really uh, starts to erode what the office can be. And so we kind of worked around that. Um, and, and that's essentially where, where we kind of took the premise. So you get uh, moments in the project that are, they do have private workrooms, but rather than having just a sea of desks, we just remove it as a void. So it becomes just about open air and more of this connection to the outdoors and, and more of a uh, uh, just kind of a, a free form spot. Um, collaboration spaces become even more, uh, more connected to that space where you can roll back the doors, there's an adjacent courtyard and it's just a spot for people to kind of get together for a second. But looking at landscape features, maybe become indoors more um, as the stones kind of roll into the interior space. So it's a, it's a it's a meeting space. It's a it's a conference room, more or less. But it, it's essentially a captured piece of the outdoors that you're experiencing. So, um, but it's it's treated in a way that you can actually have a have a meeting there as well. Um, and then if there is work going on, it's probably more about focused, kind of more, um, kind of I've just got to get in my zone and, and and talk with somebody or work on something, but still have this great use of light. Um, and, and really feel like I'm, I have a spot to be centered. Um, again, looking at the challenge of the open, open office and how that can be maybe more focused um, in the space. And again, you know, if, if it's all about supporting the office culture, they have a, an amazing library that everybody wants to go to and it's right next to this great spot to read a book and it's got great lighting, like all those environmental uh, things are what bring people here, hopefully. So, it's, it's something where we, we think, you know, it's, it's can the architecture become such a special thing that drives people back uh, to do things, but it's probably not to do the same thing they were doing pre-pandemic, right? They're not just gonna come here and sit and work for hours, but they're gonna come here, have a lecture or see somebody that uh, they haven't connected with in a couple of weeks or something. So really relying on or pushing towards um, shifting the workplace towards a, a culturally in internal driven uh, component. This is the all hands meeting space, which is really just like a private park um, as part of the project. Um, it's where we stack up one side, there's a kitchen on the right for parties or whatever. Um, but it's a, it's a much different uh, situation than the classroom style with, with one um, kind of projector screen off to one side. So um, again, it, it becomes more of a, uh, an amphitheater uh, and sort of a forum for, for connection in that way. First off, um, Clayton, your work is just so incredibly inspiring. And um, you know, before I jump in, I almost want to find myself saying, um, "Hey, can we collaborate at some point?" <laughs> yeah, anytime. <laughs> um, but you know, what's really interesting about this? What I had decided to do was a, a little bit of a different take, and that was to go ahead and to um, talk specifically about one project. And um, before I do that, I, I do want to go ahead and talk a little bit about where I am in life right now. And um, after 27 and a half years, um, in 2019 actually, after an incredible career at MVBJ, I decided that um, in turning 60, that it was time not only for uh, a new decade, but also for a new chapter. And with that, decided I really wanted to leave MBBJ. I had just completed some amazing projects, um, this being one of them. But I wanted to leave because I really wanted to explore some different options in a much smaller scale perspective. And 
I love interdisciplinary design. I love the idea of bringing amazing experts together, but I was really ready to take a look at that in a much smaller scale uh, of work and also um, work that I didn't feel was um, commodity. And um, that's a real challenge sometimes when you find that your focus is uh, commercial interiors. And with that, it was a wonderful opportunity and the timing was absolutely perfect for me to think about my departure. Um, I had just completed and you know, onto this project here, I had just completed um, the final construction documents and uh, for REI's corporate headquarters, which is another lecture at some point I'd love to talk about. Um, the first time we've ever designed a building that was actually not occupied and sold before the occupants went in it. Um, and um, then I, I, I had just completed this building here um, to Union, the repositioning. So it, I, I think I'll jump in and talk a little bit more about that right now. So we just have one singular project um, relative to Threshold. Um, when I moved to um, Seattle 30 years ago, I had this idea that we were just going to be here for two years or so. My um, partner at the time, husband now, was with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency. And the thinking had been that, you know what, eventually we will land up in Massachusetts. I grew up um, in the outskirts of New York. And the idea that we were going to be in Seattle was only going to be temporary. Well, here we are 30 years later. Um, but having relocated from New York City um, into Seattle at that time, it was just an amazing um, contrast of what I had understood as city. Um, again, my parents were both New Yorkers. New York was my frame of reference. And I moved to Seattle and I went down into the, grand, into the central um, business district to see um, that skyline that you see straight ahead in 1989. And um, I was perplexed by it. Um, I have since grown to appreciate what it means to, uh, to reside in a city like Seattle um, through its ups and downs. But with that said, I remember um, going into town with my portfolio and looking up into the skyline and there were three major buildings that were under construction at that time. One was um, a local architectural firm, it was US Bank Center. Um, Callison had designed it and uh, it was just above a mid-rise. Another one was a Cohen Patterson Fox building, which was the 1201 Third Avenue. And it was classic Cohen Patterson Fox. Um, as a matter of fact, you can even see it there in the um, skyline. Um, and then the third was to Union Square. And I remember looking up at Union Square and saying, I absolutely have got to work for the architectural firm that designed that while I'm here in Seattle. And in a wonderful turn um, of events, I did land at MBBJ. And um, as it turns out, it was my last project um, that I ended up doing with MBBJ. But it also was the last project um, that I had the marvelous opportunity of working with my mentor and um, whose father was one of the founders of the firm, Bill Bain. Um, so in a wonderful um, opportunity to reposition this building, uh, it also was a wonderful opportunity to work with the original design partner. And uh, so as you take a look at this building, you can see it became a legacy building for MBBJ on so many fronts. Um, it was one of the first buildings and it was distinctly um, in the press, architectural press and everything else, referenced as a regional you know, building. And they talked about Northwest regionalism. Um, it almost had a lure associated with it as well and that it was the first time that um, a firm such as MBBJ had done a commission of this scale and it really did become signature for the firm. Um, but it also spoke to um, the North, you know, the Northwest regionalism and the idea that so many of these storied components um, that are associated with the Northwest were referenced in this building, quite literally, as um, you can see, and as uh, has been referenced here, um, everything from industry, from Boeing to shipping, to um, now technology as well, but airplane industries. So it was all a take on this building. The image, so straight ahead is um, 1989. To your right is um, 2019. And you'll notice in this picture, if you look closely, it is surrounded by the Amasaki building, um, which is the original Rainer Square. And then another MBBJ building is framing it to the left. Uh, which is the new Rainier Tower. Um, and then smack in the middle here is the two union. The flag is at half mast. Um, it, it was taken the day of um, 
uh, Bill's memorial service. He um, he actually was able to finish the project with us all, and um, in the, the middle of June he um, he passed away, and we were so pleased that he was able to participate. So my personal story is an important one. Um, so I'm going to just show you, I think it's always really important to give some context. This is really focused on the interiors of the building. And again, this storied interiors. This one is circa 1989. I show this to you because um, what a difference a couple of decades make. Um, we had a client that came towards us, the new owners being um, Washington Holdings, and said, you know, this building has been remarkable for 30 years. It actually indeed um, is a building, even with its age, um, has always maintained a really, really high rate of occupancy. As a matter of fact, 97%. Well, you can imagine um, in a city like Seattle that's booming, that the economy was changing. Um, there were Amazon had joined certainly the network of uh, technology organizations joining the firm and changing or joining the city and, and changing the landscape with um, their new buildings and developers um, we're putting in a very different sort of class A office building, if you will. Um, to Union, while it's always been a premier address, found that it was really time to step back and revisit some of what, again, MBBJ had done 30 years ago. So in hiring us to do us while I was with the firm to do this work, um, there were some really important components that they wanted to make sure we adhered to. And that was very much the story, the story around nature, the story around movement, the story around tectonics. But to go ahead and fast forward it to um, this year, you know, 2019, 2020, to talk about the Northwest as it evolved. Um, so you can see this is, <laughs> this, is um, this looks pretty vintage at this point and um, a pretty challenging effort to undertake. Um, I'm going to jump right in now to what we ended up doing as we jumped into the repositioning of this building. Um, so 20 foot walls around the core, um, this opportunity to go ahead and really redefine, you know, what your moment is once you cross that threshold, how you navigate a building, how you understand where you're landing at every point within the building and how you create a very different sort of experience. Um, Washington Holdings and, um, you know, the owners of the building was very much sympathetic um, to what originally had been there, but very much wanted to have some continuity in design and continuity in how we were approaching the overall design process. And it was roughly 65,000 square feet in terms of the public spaces. It's a 50, um, 56 story building. And we did end up doing the elevator lobbies as well. But the focus on this one is really the public space and some of the challenges that we dealt with here. Um, so here is the floor plan, and um, the floor plan to the right is what was um, what we landed with, and um, that was relative to the, the repositioning and some of the challenges that we were able to address in the building. Are you able to see my cursor? I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we were able to do is, um, and we thought was really important to do here was. The prior condition of this floor plate here um, really had challenges in terms of how it did meet, um, how it did meet the cityscape. Um, the main lobby was uh, three stories off of um, the, the main street level and uh, a fair amount of parking was continually happening within the building and that would enable many of the tenants to get into the space. But when we started to take a look at the building itself, we took a look at the North Edge, which was more in context <clears throat> around taking a look at the city and seeing sort of the overall texture of the city, this edge ended up leading you to I-5 and, and, and a freeway park. And this one was greenery that was really unusual and an important part of the overall design precept that was lost um, in the years of iterations that occurred in the building. And that was a beautiful greenscape on this edge. <clears throat> in taking a look at the prepositioning, what they ended up doing was they kept clients and had them on the ground floor obstructing all of the potential views. So consequently, the circulation on the space and how one arrived at this space was really challenged in that you had just one way to get into the building, one way to get into your elevator throats, and the entire experience of the rest of the space was lost to a ground floor tenant. 
When we went into the repositioning of the main lobby, what we ended up doing here is we brought the tenants and opened up the entire floor plate itself, recognizing, of course, that in this day and age that there were different needs and different demands associated with um, what an office building was going to be and what a main lobby and arrival sequence was going to be. It was no longer intended to be something that you just passed through. It became destination points and additional work points throughout the course of the day and very different sorts of functions that were necessary to go ahead and make this a contemporary environment that again would maintain some of the, um, the, the competitive edge in wanting to keep clients in the building. Um, we ended up blowing out that space and ended up putting in some coffee spaces um, that were informal gathering spaces, and then really took a look at some individualized work points or meeting spaces um, without the, throughout the space here along this edge, and then ended up creating a level shift along the side of the building here um, that really ended up giving us some premier views. Um, this is um, as you start to see the space itself. Um, over here, um, this is obviously the main arrival point that we started to speak to here, a travertine wall that <laughs> we ended up doing design computation that enabled us to go ahead and explore a multitude of different design solutions. And much of this was driven by the client and his vision for really wanting to make sure that we were addressing what he called um, some of the tectonics that were occurring in terms of this overall area around um, the Seattle region, and that we take a look at a fractal wall that's representative of some of the volcanic regions and such. And with that said, we ended up with a travertine wall, and I can go into a little bit more detail around this, that was totally clad um, with the same material and simplified, if you will, the overall experience of the space as you arrived. We ended up, much like Clayton in here, also introducing a wave ceiling that was an important component as well and that it tied into the idea of the tidal pools and the movement of wind and some of the story that was very important for them moving forward. Um, part of what you can also see here is some of the park view here, but an opportunity to go ahead and peel back what was and go ahead and make it memorable and no longer a place that you pause, sit and potentially sleep where there was some seating that typically was happening in front of here, but reason to pause and go to your left or to your right and activate it in a place um, as well. Moving on to this in a little bit more detail, some of the imagery that we did um, really focused on in terms of the overall detail and resolve as such was how do you go ahead and reinforce potentially a more open space for individuals to be waiting, but again, start to capture that work point and an elevated lounge zone that's happening along this edge right here. Um, part of what was interesting about doing this was it was at this point a sill height that was close to 30 inches. And by elevating this ramp, we had this appearance of this creating a floor to ceiling view out into the freeway park in green, which was virtually unheard of. Um, what was really unique about this building here as well is they had the opportunity to go ahead and um, capitalize on years and years ago what was one acre in the middle of downtown. And again, it's for the most part focused primarily on the tenants and their use as well, but it was just not an area that people were going out and migrating toward and using. And because I think of the approach to the building itself, very few knew about it. So by opening up this space, there was almost this wonderment of, oh my gosh, the ability to see the outdoors, see the nature and the, the circadian movement of a day um, was a really important aspect of this and a way of modulating the space. Um, and again, it's in the small details and it's in the larger moves as well. So the idea of punctuating these spaces with some uh, um, light fixtures that I think even Clayton used. Um, one of the material concepts that we wanted to make sure that we addressed here and simplifying this as well was really just highlighting an elemental palette, if you will. Um, we have the, and this is a Rulon, custom Rulon ceiling 
and I can talk a little bit more about later, that um, takes up the entirety of the space itself, but also has an unusual challenge of having to migrate between a 20 foot ceiling height and an enclosed mezzanine space that dropped down to 12 feet. Hence, you'll see the movement in the uh, overall in, uh, installation of this uh, element where at some points it's dropping down, at some points it's dropping up. And that wasn't just a folly. That was actually just responding to a mezzanine that we had to address and cover and make sure that we dealt incredible detail and in seeing it resolved and maintain the fluidity that we were trying very hard to accomplish here. Um, you can start to see again, as I referenced earlier, the Traventine um, elements that cover the entire core. And then as we started to go inside of those elevator throats, we reintroduced some of the walnut. And again, story was so important to this client and this idea of let's make sure that we're maintaining what has been established as the regionalism. And this idea of forestry, this idea of bringing in um, this closed compressed space that's much darker, but has the ability to go ahead and suggest that you're into a place of passage. Um, we ended up using um, bronze throughout and uh, was an important aspect as well. And you'll see that in the introduction of the wall. So as you can see from the previous shots, a very complicated palette now trying to simplify it and make sense of it and provide a thread of continuity throughout. Here again is another view as I started to speak to the compressed elevator lobbies. Um, these images, and you'll see there's a variety of images. We've, um, we had some that were taken at night, some that were taken at day. Kevin Scott um, did some amazing photography for us, as did Sean Earhart in capturing this. And you'll see later in this slide uh, presentation, some not so great shots, and those have um, very much to do with me, <laughs> um, some recent ones. But with that said, um, the integration of signage was a really important component. All the subtle details thought through. The recessing of the bronze basing, the um, embedded and terrazzo floor for us as well. Um, the embedded uh, carpets in the terrazzo floors. Again, um, we all know that that resolution to detail and that um, real commitment to making sure it's thoroughly resolved becomes paramount in some of the decisions that we try to make. Um, here is um, yet another comparison of this. Some of these um, slightly, obviously, um, smaller scaled conference areas where the tenants have the ability to meet and in many cases conduct business. Um, and the modulation of that space and the atmospheric quality of that screening was important, particularly because we had the ceiling that was happening up above and the movement of that. So this idea of creating a place and, and signature place for each one of those, we had very defined furniture pieces in each one of them. But this idea of giving it an atmospheric quality where the meetings typically wouldn't go longer you know, than an hour or so, but still felt a sense of separation and a sense of place. And again, um, this idea of as you cross a threshold, be it material, you know, uh, on the floors, or be it the vertical movements within the space that creates that idea of separation, these were all the things that um, we were driving towards in getting this resolved. Again, another view um, from throat to throat. Okay, in the elevator. Um, I wanted to just talk about um, the importance too. Um, I paired these two slides closely together. These were early, this was a very early rendering um, and it was, believe it or not, pulled from the Revit model. And with the Revit model, we had a lot of different um, other aspects that we added onto it and to try to accomplish this, including some, yeah, obviously some, some, some different um, um, furniture pieces, some different approaches to um, the attachments to the Revit model that enabled us to get to this place, some Photoshop. But it was really, really important um, to be able to go ahead and to demonstrate to the client what our thinking had been. And it's amazing to think how these components, while very sort of straightforward, can tell a story that's important. And it can also tell a story that enables you to say, there's some serious editing that needs to be considered um, along the way because it was coming in from the Revit model. Some of the things that I had mentioned previously was this idea of ramping up a space that went from a sill height to then went to floor to ceiling um, height. 
of glass and it gives you this feeling that um, you're just literally outside, but it was a clever way of changing the modulation of the space. Um, and through some of these studies, we ended up obviously simplifying some of the components. Why would we want that sort of furniture in there? But it gave us an opportunity again to take a look at a space in such a way that we were continually referencing it as um, an opportunity to revise and edit. Um, here is that rant I'm talking about. <clears throat> and you can see as it starts to jump out and look outside um, and the greenery that's happening in that space is really important um, from the client's perspective because they've never had this before. It was totally shut off. Okay, I'm watching my time here. Um, we go into the view to the park and here we go again, right there in the middle of the city, who would have known? Um, GGN, um, while it was not the original um, landscape architecture firm, um, did come in and started to do some consulting with us. And there is at some point an anticipated look uh, re-landscaping the exterior spaces um, in the building and the greenery in conjunction with them. So we hope to have that happen soon. But again, you can see this feels pretty enormous, wide open. Um, yet another sort of important component of the space was the staircase that leads you down into the access of those courtyards. Again, as I started to speak about the materiality of this space and the importance of it, the reintroduction of the bronze wall. And while it was gritty on many fronts, um, it became a really important element that created a link to um, a passage and ascending and descending within the space itself. And that anchoring was important um, from a wayfinding perspective as well, but again, to providing access to the outdoor space. Um, so we're going down to third floor. Mm -hmm. You can see again, some of these signature moves. Um, what we originally had shown um, was a pretty convoluted approach, but you can see that um, through a simple move of bringing the ceiling up and again, framing these with the bronze panels um, that while the escalator had no upgrades, it suddenly felt like it took on a life of its own. One that was a lot more um, uh, appealing to be using and to, um, to even witness as it was integrated into this system. Signage again is always a really important component within this space. Um, we always talked about the idea of making sure that these activated public spaces um, are simplified because when you start to take a look at whether it's your retailers, whether it's vendors, when you start to take a look at that aspect of how the space is populated, you wanna make sure that you're creating always a canvas in which many, many things can be happening. Um, here is, again, from context, this is um, the exterior of the building. And this is looking up actually from the internal courtyard. And you can start to take a look at, um, this is a rather abysmal day, and this was a Photoshop that I just took the other day. Um, here is the full site context of the, the building itself. So as we talked about this, this is the main elevator. Um, lobby is up on level three. Um, here is the freeway park and the ramping system. It starts to give you the broader sense. The stairs that you descend down into and then begin to open you up into this outdoor exterior courtyard. Part of what was important here as well is the connection from one pedestrian connection to another to the building. And again, similar to, I believe, you know, what Clayton was saying about um, his tower <laughs> is that it was a very convoluted approach to the building itself. And how do you simplify that? And how do you make that much more friendly? Much of it had to do with creating a vestibule entry from Union Street that happened off of this ground area and that we ended up, grounded area here ended up being landscaped and ended up having some access to those streets themselves. But this truly became the front door when indeed this wanted to be the front door. So while we weren't able to address all those issues here, we did go ahead and do some major renovation of that ground floor space, putting in an anchor tenant, and then again, always having the access to this outdoor garden with that, we also had plenty of um, pedestrian movement over here with lots of different retailers as well, which activated the space. And again, from these components enabled you to get outdoors, outdoors being really important. 
Um, there's also a signature space here. It's called the Oculus and there's a fireplace lobby which connects it to another building. So a pretty complicated um, kit of parts, if you will, in terms of how we're trying to address and great some serious continuity between these spaces. But um, it was really important to go ahead and make sure that we were able to be smart in everything that we touched and know that particularly with the landscape that we would be coming at a later date on that. Here it is, the outdoor space right now on sort of a grim day. So if you're hearing my dogs in the neighborhood. Um, another view from the outdoors, which is highly uncommon to find these sort of courtyard spaces, um, you know, at the store step, if you will, of a, of a 56 foot high rise building. Um, and again, these were some pretty interesting shots that at one point will be even further restored to what was originally on site. Here is the connecting fireplace lobby. Again, there was an Oculus within the space and totally simplified, as you can see. Um, we reduced the overall scale of the fireplace itself and created enough space where people didn't find themselves um, parking for extended hours. And that was a really important aspect from the building owners that this was a space that was activated and that there was a lot of movement um, within the space and it was just brief touchdown areas as well. We opened up this area for natural, uh, this Oculus, I don't have an image of it, but the Oculus itself looks directly up at the tower because this is on the ground level here. And again, the detailing was everything. Oh, excuse me. Um, here's where we started to talk a little bit about the, um, the, the, the wood ceiling. Um, again, as I had referenced earlier, um, we ended up using computational design and these overall planks that we ended up using in, with Rulon and it was custom work that we had done in St. Augustine. Um, some of the pieces themselves and in order to you know, reduce waste, um, some of them were as long as 50 feet, 50 and 60 feet. Um, it was an incredible effort um, to bring the teams in to install this. We used the computational design a lot of engineering, a lot of back and forth, did some, this is actually from the mock-up, or no, this is actually from the mezzanine, but um, it, a tremendous amount was required to make sure that we had this directly in place and had the team who could be installing this. So it was a lengthy process um, and it was really important that we made sure that we maximized every bit of this. And of course, cost always came into play as it will, um, but ultimately we were able to achieve this um, within the ceiling itself. Um, here's some of the detail on the fractal wall or the great wall, they call it too. Um, and again, it was really important to be referencing um, the tectonic activity, which is the derivative of this here. But um, you can see we ended up through some of the design modeling we did, we were able to determine where waste potentially was going to be happening. This was all going to be quarried in Tivoli, um, Italy. And um, there had to actually be some precision in terms of how every single piece was cut. I mean, the planks themselves that came into play with the exception of some of these areas were typically 12 inches, um, 12 inches high by three feet wide. And there were 1400 pieces in total um, that made up the wall. But with that said, um, the precision that was required in using their CNC to get this just right um, required a lot of back and forth with our computational team who worked on the project and partly why it was um, the importance of trying to reduce the chipping that potentially was going to be at risk. What was important for the client too is to recognize that this was going to be another 30 year project. Um, so I can start to see this. Um, as we started to talk about the detailing, and this is just a micro look at some of those detailing, but the importance of this and um, the great appreciation um, I have for our team and the importance of making sure you resolve every detail. So while these are just samplings of some of the details you can be seeing here, it had everything to do with how we're integrating those requirements for fire extinguishers and how we integrate the detailing around a handle that enables you to use and get to that fire extinguisher, but that it's um, it, it feels as if it's part of the place, not a, lat, a later add-on. Um, again, some of the mitered corners were really incredible challenges here within the space um, and making sure that we had the exact um, rigor around how that was resolved. 
Um, and then again, this idea of this was actually coming from the elevated ramp itself. We did have some of our stainless pools, but making sure that things were coplanar and that, um, you know, so that things were fully integrated in that because it does make a difference, um, particularly when you're making moves as large as this. Um, the other thing that I started to referencing was the, the rendering from the actual space. And then here's actually an image of it. So this is when we're actually um, working with a client to market the building itself. It was important that we went out and we actually had um, these renderings done out of house, but based on our Revit model. But you can start to see the importance of this and even seeing some of the inflections. And this was still under development from some perspective um, in terms of how it was going to be resolved but it's pretty remarkable to see um, just how close it can get you to that reality and the importance of that. We obviously made some furniture changes that occurred um, once we understood these things later. So it did become uh, a point at which we were able to go ahead and have decisions and um, further discussions about what was actually occupying the space. Um, again, so I thought it was interesting to take a look at that. Um, so I'm getting close to the end here. So, but what I did wanna do is just talk about um, the repositioning of the space here. So a frame of reference in terms of here's the original, if you will, uh, from 1989. And this is the pedestrian walkway. Here is then the revision. So opening this up now into the garden areas, having multiple touch points where people can be grabbing coffee and really taking a look at how we were addressing um, how we were addressing the retailers that were required in there. Everything from a coffee shop, to a shoe shop, to a flower shop. Those things were important um, as amenities to the general building, um, as well as yoga studios. There's a whole range of those um, you know, desired requirements right now um, for tenants thinking about buildings. And I guess I should say that was 2019, not necessarily 2020, which we'll get to. Um, here's the, we were just in the fireplace lounge and you can see over the years, there were some, additions that were added into the space. It felt as it felt more like a hotel lobby. Um, and again, to see what we're able to do in terms of the cleaning it up, you know, it clearly is connected back to the main space of itself. And it has that movement of place rather than this idea of sedentary um, zone to sit in front of a fireplace and uh, read your paper all day long, which was, I guess, one of the things that they were always very concerned about. But again, the daylight penetration is pretty remarkable in once you clear out that ceiling. Um, it was a huge challenge also to talk the client into a terrazzo. So I was laughing about your terrazzo comment. Um, we really felt like it was an important aspect of the space to create a building, number one, that um, had reduced maintenance. The entire space had been carpeted in that pedestrian area. So the introduction of that hard surface in terrazzo, and we embedded it with mother of pearl, some, thing, some, some actually stones of the region as well. And again, the desire to tie that story back, but it was a real win to make sure that we were able to land the terrazzo, um, just give the freshness to it. Here you go, you can see the original. So as I referenced earlier, this idea of having people sit and pause versus take in what really became an installation, if you will, of art for them and a signature piece. Um, this is one of the shots that Sean took during the evening, which I, I just love because it speaks to sort of opening up that space and being able to look to the city to the north and into the green at the south. And again, one of our signature, <laughs> one of our signature images that we use for the building and the client uses for the building is that wood ceiling itself. So I'm just going to jump into where we are today, which I think is a really important component. So here we are. We're 15 months later. And I, what I thought was really fascinating about this was um, now what does this mean to a building that's been repositioned in downtown Seattle um, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of some very challenging tax structures um, that are happening in downtown Seattle and um, quite frankly, driving many tenants out of Seattle. Um, and what does it all mean? So it was really a, a nice opportunity for me to go ahead and have a conversation with the owner of the building and say, you know, what does this mean for you right now? And how are you occupying this space? And what does threshold really mean for you? Well, it's all closed off. And um, here's an example. I just have one of the interior shots here. You can see the signature PPE. Um, um, we're all dying for some beautiful designs of PPE. 
uh, stations, but virtually everything is closed off. Um, my understanding is that there's only 30% of the um, tenants in the building are actually using the building right now, that um, almost all of the retail spaces have gone dark, and that, as a matter of fact, it was just last week um, I was told that they opened up one of the coffee shops. Uh, and the reason they, on, on this main floor, because the tenants were really feeling for those who were occupying it, they had no amenities, no access to coffee, to lunch or whatever. Um, so you can imagine uh, what all of this means to um, all these commercial developers moving forward. Uh, it's, it's quite a contrast. Um, the exterior of the building, as I came up to it, um, was clad with and shut down. So this is uh, this is uh, a James Beard Award-winning chef's uh, restaurant, Cortina John um, Ethan Stoll's restaurant, um, which was an important anchor for this building itself, and is boarded up. Um, what's really interesting about it um, was one to see that um, because they are the client that they are, and they're very interested in the community, very interested in the arts, and recognize this as an opportunity not just to board up the building, but as an opportunity to go ahead and enable a statement to be made and enable it to be um, something that's just beyond, um, beyond plywood. Um, a street view, as you can see. And I, I looked at this image here, and it was just, it's just unbelievable to think. Currently, there's 58 doors um, that have access to the building, and that's um, with two union and one union that are connected to one another. And there's roughly four to eight doors that are open with card key access, which is just simply unbelievable. Um, so I, I bring this up because, again, uh, what does this mean to our cities moving forward? What does it mean to what it means to be in a high rise building and uh, to have a workforce that may not return to work? So it's some interesting challenges lie ahead for us in terms of how these will be resolved. Um, they're optimistic, um, but this is a close up, um, which I found incredibly um, compelling. And it's uh, one of the artists who was um, wrote, or not wrote, uh, one of the artists who was associated with um, the CHOP, which is the Capitol Hill occupied area up in um, Seattle that was so much in the news. And uh, he was heavily involved in some of the um, some of the artwork that was happening up there in terms of the occupied zone. He uh, and this was um, also placed out here on the, on the door and um, is his overall statement. His name is Barry Johnson. Uh, so I um, take a look at this and I have a great appreciation. And, and my understanding is as he was putting up these, um, these boards that he was harassed um, in the throes of it. And um, I'm really happy that they were able to Number one, maintain these and they will save them. Um, the last word that I had gotten from the building owner was, I'm incredibly sad to think that um, we finally took these, these boards down mid-July. Um, they did go up as the rioting started and they, they did come down and a week later they had to go back up. And um, the hope was that they were going to maintain these until the election results. So um, we'll be waiting to see what happens to this ground plane and what happens to um, the threshold into this building, if you will. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, that was a great, I think, contradiction to um, Clean's work as well. So I'm just excited to to hear from you both now. And um, I I wanted to kick it off with a question, and I'll then I'll open it up to the students as well. And I I think Anne, you you really touched on it at the end um, of your of your talk, um, you know, we have experienced the tectonic shift of 2020, mm -hmm. and uh, I think we are, are still doing so. Um, and I want to know from both of you what you feel um, the role of design should be as we approach this, this new um, 
space that we're all in? And, and how do you think the design profession should be engaging in the dialogue um, that will be, you know, 2021 and beyond? Um, I'd love to hear from you about, about that um, future, hopeful or, or otherwise. Well, I'll start for a minute. I just think that there's um, what I have appreciated about this this moment in time is that, if anything, um, the power of design and the importance of design um, is um, no more prevalent than it ever could be today in terms of our ability to influence outcome. And um, one of the things, and yes. Sedona will attribute this as well to um, one of the things that we have talked to about a fair amount is this opportunity right now that's unheard of and an opportunity to experiment and an opportunity um, just to experiment without the typical con consequences that one has in exploiting different approaches or fabrications or such. Um, and I actually think that that's one of the most interesting things that's happening right now because the problems are so vast. There is such a requirement for a rapid response um, in order to get those to occupy um, these buildings again or to be able to address what's going to be required in these buildings as well. And so I just see it as a really interesting time that you can be doing work unapologetically you know, unfettered, and you really want to be thinking with some amazing potential out there in terms of anything can go and no apologies. I, I really like the unapologetic uh, part of it. I, I think that that's what's really, what's really good. And, and I would add to that, that it's, I would say, unapologetically optimistic also. Yeah. Um, I think designers across all the disciplines, interior, architecture, landscape, mm -hmm. beyond, mm -hmm. are, are almost always the optimist in the room, even, even on a bad day. Uh, <laughs> and I, I think that, you know, what's, what's nice, kind of echoing what, what Anne's saying, is that there's a moment to sort of reset and look at, like what we've done, is look at, look at your practice and, mm -hmm. and what, what in it is, is going gonna, is gonna to address the problems. You know, I, I think turning towards the problems and, and looking at, you know, you know, really trying to pay attention to what's what's going on and and trying to put that into the work as much as possible. For for us, it's and from the clients that we've we've been working with, it's been you know, like they don't have a solution. It's like a completely like you know kind of flat. You know, there's not a, there's not a typical way to address any of the kind of things going on right now. And it's it's turning to the person in the room that has the ideas normally, which are the designers. Um, but I think also there's a call on, on the other end to, for designers to sort of elevate and, and continue to pursue what those changes can be. Like, it's like even simple things like when you go to the PPE in your photo and you reference someone should design a better one, like we see the world that way. Mm -hmm. I know it's like an aesthetic thing and it's, it's just kind of standing there, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, well, well how, how can we do better? And I, I think those things mm -hmm. designers bring to these, these, these problems a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's just to like, again, the unapologetic thing, like just, go for really being positive and trying to address and solve those things. I think the thing not to do is to like ignore and, and, and consider it a status quo and kind of keep going, mm -hmm. uh, let alone you'll be forced to change. That's, that's always the case. But uh, I think uh, being excited about the change, being very clear on the problems. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, just, just leading with optimism and, and experimentation to try to get things moving forward. And again, that's kind of echoing back. That's it's like designs really, really super matters in these situations to try and uh, think and, and, and create a, another path. Um, across all sectors, there's, um, there's a whole new database, if you will, right? Of understanding um, that you really can be working differently. Um, and that you really do work in many different, you know, many different environments that you would not have even imagined. Um, even us as workplace designers, we never would have imagined, you know, some of the places that we found ourselves actually conducting work and being able to accomplish work. So I think that there's different patterns, there's going to be different rhythms, and all those things can't be lost. And um, the idea of tapping into every demographic and saying, you know, so what made it work for you? What made it work for you? I, you know, what are your expectations? Yeah, there's no surprise right now that there's a huge boom that's happening in the residential markets 
know, as a consequence of this and creating environments within their spaces. So to Clayton's point, this desire to come back for a different sort of environment, a different sort of engagement is what's most important. You know, this idea of being able to rift with someone. I mean, you see me, I'm like, oh, the computer. Um, I just want like to be able to have the face-to-face -face or to be able to collaborate, um, you know, with uh, multiple groups and what was, you know, so easily taken for granted. Um, so anyway, I think that there are different sort of um, expectations that cannot be lost, you know, because I think some of it is really, really smart learning that we can be applying to different environments moving forward. Flexibility, and that's another thing. <laughs> I'd like to take a moment to just um, uh, introduce the students that are here um, participating with us today. Um, we have um, some invited guests and I'm hoping that each of you will be able to introduce yourselves and um, uh, please participate and um, ask a question of our guests. My name is Sedona Breach. I'm the current AIS president and I'm a fourth year um, interior architecture undergraduate student. Hi, I'm uh, Carly Ocon. I am the treasurer of the IIDA and I am a third year interior architecture graduate, undergraduate student. My name is Irina Volonides. I'm a second year PhD student in landscape architecture, but I am also a practicing architect and I have to um, uh, companies back in my country. Um, one is focused on architecture and another is focused on landscape design. And I'm really excited to hear this lecture today. And I have lots of questions to follow up later. Well, I liked the question you had. Um, and so I was kind of going off of that, the answers that Anne and Clayton provided with like unapologetic experimentation and opportunity. And so I was really interested in kind of your, your both of your perspectives on the integration of sustainability and this concept of indoor outdoor and kind of ways that that will, I guess, be a pivotal point in future design and, and ways that it's kind of molded what we think about wellness and the integration of biophilic design. And also just how we've, I think in this time we've realized anything is really possible. Um, and so ways that maybe it's kind of an open-ended, sorry, there's a lawnmower, um, but it's kind of an open-ended question um, about your opinion towards how sustainability and wellness will be integrated in the future, I guess. I, I have kind of one, one take on it. We have a project in Austin that we're doing right now that was funded right before the pandemic started, so they're, they're committed, they're going forward. Um, it's about a quarter million square feet of office, but um, the conversation that project shifted a lot, which was really great to see. Um, it uh, was a heavy lead discussion, which which was in in that world, it was kind of about gaining gaining points and, and going down that that road. Uh, again, good sustainable measures in place, but there was also that that kind of uh, scorecard component. But then it shifted towards a wellness discussion, which has been really exciting to see um, for like yoga spaces or just like really simple things like a sit to stand desk for the security guard that's there, you know, like health across everybody that maintains the building, how it functions, you know, really focusing on uh, air circulation is a big component of that operability. Like all those things that I think architects have like, just like fought for, for like years, like to get a window that opens, you know, uh, it, it's, it's now like considered extremely, extremely valuable from, from kind of the whole, the whole approach. So I personally have really approach, appreciated the, the kind of more drive towards wellness and, and what that means all the way, I think even discussions about mental health and wellness in spaces that are like really forefront now. Uh, I, to me, that, that's, that's a discussion that is, is very relevant, but it was, it was hard to bring up uh, sometimes with, with clients or, or put some, some value behind that. But now it's like a real, as everyone kind of feels what their workspace is and how it functions and, and puts that into how we design and, and you know, put value into those spaces. So for me, I, I think the sustainability measures are still just as, as relevant, but to pair with that, like a real wellness agenda, yeah. I think is really exciting. Yeah. Um, if I, I, I could add on to that too, I, I, I agree. I mean, this idea of creating healthful environments 
is so um, prevalent and even more so again. Um, you, you know, I've had the opportunity to work on a couple of healthcare um, projects and the lines have been really blurred, um, but there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that in terms of healing. You know, healing does happen when you have a view to nature. You know, this idea of making sure that you have the ability to focus, the idea of having access to those outdoors. But in addition to that, in terms of the wellness, um, you know, self-organizing, um, self-organizing classes that have an opportunity to happen outdoors when space is provided. But there's two other filters that I think come into place right now that um, are heightened. Um, we've talked a lot about circadian rhythms and daylight and access to nature and the potential of healing and mental health, um, absolutely. But you know, having worked on a number of different buildings that do have those operable windows, having just endured one of the single worst environmental crises in the Northwest this past summer, you found yourself thinking a little differently about that. So air filtration and the importance of that as a backup. And what does that mean? We certainly all want outdoor access and fresh air in our spaces. But it was a really, um, it was a really challenging sort of moment in time where you're saying, okay, um, I had worked on some projects that they couldn't have that because they were concerned with uh, environmental, you know, um, uh, anyway, they were, they were concerned um, from, a safety component that there could be gassing or something like that happening, but we actually had to happen in our back doors. So I think that that's a really interesting challenge that we're going to be having moving forward here. And again, security as yet another, um, you know, the ability in some of the work that you had shown Clayton that was really marvelous was those outdoor courtyards. You know, they're secured and you do have the ability to disintegrate that boundary or that threshold, if you will, where it feels like it's indoor, it's outdoor. And I think that's really, really important, but the idea of security as one, and then wellness um, in a way that we're all experiencing right now from a safety, you know, from a safety component to um, air quality um, in a very different sort of way than we have anticipated given the current crisis that we're in. Off of that a little bit is uh, the conversation where a lot of modern architecture is really pushing for um, inclusion and really speaking to the pedestrian to lead people into buildings and creating these really public common spaces that can be used by everyone. But with the modern kind of 2020 circumstances, all of a sudden there's been this kind of lockdown of a lot of buildings and this level of exclusivity that has been brought to design. What are some of your kind of thoughts or solutions that you've kind of thought of that can really help to push inclusivity um, and combat this exclusive nature that 2020 has created, but at the same time still kind of speaking to the modern need to keep things a little bit more closed off to allow social distancing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where we're looking for some great thoughts coming from this next generation of amazing designers because it's not an easy answer. It really is not. I mean, short of, I mean, there's some amazing opportunities, I think, to be looking to how Europe is addressing some of the, um, the, the, the current access, even I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the cities for sure, in terms of, you know, those cities who've been greatly impacted and having to all of a sudden occupy streets. Right. And um, there's something marvelous about that in terms of what does that mean from urban, you know, the, the whole urban movement where streets are no longer like addicted to cars. And it, who would have imagined it would have been based on, you know, a pandemic that came through where you can't be indoors. So I think there's some really interesting and I'll, I'll look forward to hear um, some of your perspectives on it as well. But there's some really interesting outcomes from that that can create that. Um, more moment, but that's not so security focused. I mean, there's some beautiful courtyards that have maintained their chandelier, you know, and restaurants as such, there's chandeliers that are hanging outdoors and they're shutting them down at night um, and they're heavily guarded during the day to accomplish some of those things. So I, I really look forward to seeing what some great thinking is coming out of that. Um, but it's an opportunity to really also drive towards another huge factor in terms of car addicted individuals. You know, and what does that mean to our outdoor spaces and how we might be taking them down in a different sort of way? Yeah, I think it's, but I'm kind of, I have the same stance on, I think it's the security component of, especially I'm just thinking of like a really big building, like the, the two towers that we both looked at today you know, how you make that secure but welcoming still. And that process from 
stepping off the right of way and then getting into the elevator, you know, yeah. especially in a big building, it, it's a, it can be a very, um, you know, dangerous spot where the build, building's engaging in the public and, and how does it navigate that? And I don't have a, a solution offhand, but I think that, you know, those, those, that process of like really slowing down how people enter or speeding up how people enter, like really paying attention to that. I think, I remember in design school, there was like a course I had that was like, where's the front door? It's like, just tell me where the front door is, you know? And the whole point was to talk about entry and how that can be a process and all that things. And I think it's kind of revisiting some of that stuff um, a little bit more and then in engaging the public more and really thinking critically about how all those moments work, um, you know, from getting people equal access into the building and then having moments where you can, you know, have like a pre kind of gathering and then a gathering and then enter the doors and then, you know, things like that. I think really paying attention to that whole streetscape. Um, and, and again, I, I think the comment about how the building starts to kind of, you know, push out onto the street, like again, around Portland right now, you're seeing all the restaurants take over, um, especially in the smaller uh, neighborhood zones, fully take over streets, which is really, really exciting. And and it honestly, when they started doing that, it kind of brought a, a bit of hope back that, you know, people are out there doing stuff, you know? Uh, I think the other thing, especially right now, and, and, and what lacks in a building that's super secure is you don't actually see anybody go in because they go in and they disappear so fast. So again, it, if, 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 if I was approaching it, it would be really unraveling all those little pieces that bring connection, but also look at security and just really focus on how do they, how do they balance out I think fully secured, you know, locked on the front door. Um, it, it does protect the building, but it kind of de depletes the life out of the whole situation. And then the, if it's in a context where all the buildings are doing that in downtown, you know, then you kind of lose the, the nature of uh, uh, the environment that, that supports downtown and the life that's there. So um, I, I think it's gonna be one that's gonna come up a lot, I think. Um, you know, just really trying to figure out how to navigate that and, and challenge that. Um, and it's, I, I just think it's like a, every micro step of the way is trying to solve all of those little moments of when you see someone, when you see the front door, when you see, you feel secure, but you feel like uh, it's just so many, so many things to it, I think. So, um, yeah. I would like to add to that. I was thinking I really loved um, your work, your project that you showed today. I enjoyed Clayton, the approach that you had was by involving touches and involving senses in your interior projects. And um, your work and was really inspiring. Um, and your one comment um, that the project that you did was looking forward into 30 years in designing interior that will be appealing for users for the next 30 years mm -hmm. caught me and I kept thinking of that. And I think we all designers, architects, landscape architects, we do design by looking ahead, looking into the future, maybe in 50 years perspective, maybe sometimes in 100 years perspective. And for the last two de decades, our dominant paradigm in design was to fight the climate change and do something to resist the climate change. And sometimes consciously or subconsciously architects would do that um, no matter what client wants or doesn't want. But it seems that now over the last year, everything is changing that rapidly that our adjustments to the outside world and design world should be really quick. And my question is, how do you think our design paradigm should change now? How do you think we should design looking into the next 30 years? And if, if there is actually that um, key approach to change our design attitude, or we just have to adjust step by step with all the rapid changes that are happening. I guess I could jump in for a, a two second one. Uh, the, I think again, both Anne and I, it's the, those towers are reposition projects where those, those buildings were built, you know, a, a while ago and it, they were like kind of champions of, in their own right. Uh, and I, I think 
for me, what's been really great about reposition projects is understanding this really long life that buildings have and that reposition projects are actually much harder than ground up projects because you're dealing with history, like physical history, like things that are actually there, cultural kind of history that, that surrounds that building, even if it's only 20 years old. Um, and you're trying to create something new on top of that. So you're like kind of looking backwards and forwards. Um, and that's caused me to really think more about like, so then we start doing ground up projects and that's like, now we're thinking about repositioning our own projects 30 years down the road. So there's like, I think that, especially in, in, in American cities, I think, you know, that 30 years back, 30 years forward um, is kind of an interesting way to think about projects. Um, and I, I think, because I always to think timelessness was like from here moving forward, but I think trying to also track what's behind you a little bit, because the other thing, especially interior design uh, components is they, they, there's kind of a trend cycle of certain things, right? Terrazzo was the worst thing ever, and now it's the best thing ever, you know, like, you know, so like kind of understanding some of the, 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 the life uh, of some of the things that go on, I think is really important, but to kind of be positive on that and, and make action on it. I think it's about flexibility, but I, I don't, you know, th there's, there's some things that can be flexible, some things that are kind of permanent and trying to find where those lines are a little bit or redefine those. Um, you know, previously furniture is flexible, but everything else is kind of permanent, but maybe there's other approaches to that. Um, you know, how you divide space now is something that's, that's to be as flexible when it, when prior to the pandemic, that was something that was very permanent. Um, so subdivision of space or, um, other things like that. I think finding those other moments of being temporary with, with buildings and embracing temporary natures of buildings that they can have their own life when they go into a different mode, um, I think is important as well. Um, so I think the, the timelessness and then also the, you know, there's, there's some, something exciting about buildings being very react, reactive, really fast, like within a week they can change into something, but it's still something that's interesting and inspiring and great and beautiful and all that stuff, right? It's not like it's been cut down to uh, something else, but it, that it just becomes a different mode. Uh, so I think thinking about modes of timelessness, maybe, or something like that, you know, like there's some way that the building can kind of gain these, these levels of time scales. Um, again, it, it's all very exciting stuff. I don't know how to do it, but it's all very exciting stuff. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> I agree with everything you're saying there. I mean, one of the things that I, I know in terms of taking a look at the theory you're building or another 30 year building. It was interesting um, when we were going, um, when we were positioning for a two union, uh, we took a look at what Seattle was like 30 years earlier as a frame of reference. So Bill Gates, barely there, right? <laughs> 30 years ago, I mean, barely recognizable. Um, Howard Schultz from Starbucks, um, same sort of thing. So we took a look at sort of that trajectory. And uh, obviously, as you start to take the, the great example that we all use that has bridged the great divide is the iPhone now, in terms of the evolution of the iPhone and what has happened and, and how it's also bridged the great divide that you have 90 year olds who are using iPhones and you have, you know, three year olds who could help me navigate um, my, <laughs> my PowerPoint. Um, but, but with that said, it's a really important aspect um, in terms of the life of a building. And I always sort of think about, um, you know, it becomes a canvas, if you will. And so I, as a matter of fact, I think if there is one thing that probably will be trending in the short term, and that's what I love about it is it's the short term. I don't know what the long term is, but this idea of perception of space and clean space, and what does that mean? You know, the whole idea of a clean deck, you know, what does that mean? So that infill can happen and that it can happen rapidly and temporal nature of space as well. You know, um, uh, anyway, this idea of creating separation um, easily. Um, I love Pedro Blase's um, curtain moves that she uh, is able to sort of articulate different sorts of environments really rapidly and really have a very different sort of feel that happens within minutes within space. So I think that there's the ability to sort of take some basic elemental aspects of how we as humans are conditioned to our environments, whether it's compressor, whether it's um, you know compressed space or volumetric spaces, um, the idea of <clears throat> being able to go ahead and create those environments pretty rapidly is important, right? And um, I always, it's, it's interesting, uh, another repositioning project that I was involved in, the detailing of the building was so, uh, like, so precise. I had never seen anything like it. And clearly it was a dated building, as you could see from some of the previous images I had showed of Chu Union. But we, with good conscience, could not go in and pull out anagrade 
um, cherry that was taken from the forest, endangered forest, and pull apart the detailing and the 10 different species of marble. And what we opted to do, which was a really interesting approach, and you know, it and in some fronts it, it was incredibly successful, but you know, we've heard that there's been some shortcomings as well, but we basically inserted an element into the building that you would be able to, you know, 30 years from now go and pull it out and say, oh my gosh, that you know, that species of wood is extinct right now. So to create a veil that covers those environments, that that became a canvas, if you will, for some flexibility. But in terms of, um, you know, what I'm looking at right now is this idea of, you know, spare space, if you will. And the idea of individuals as occupying it are the ones that are creating those environments and us being able to give them tools that enable that to happen. And, um, and what I have been incredibly humbled by is where ideas are coming from. Um, you know, and that's what's been really exciting right now for those of us who have been living through, you know, this idea of occupying our homes, you know, to have, you know, my next door neighbors who, you know, have seven-year-olds are cooking up ideas left and right. And I teach art or in one of the school, I, I try to do it, you know, twice a month just to give the parents a break, but to hear some of their ideas of what they're doing. And so it's, that's what I love about it because we all know those ideas just can come from anywhere. So keep your eye on sort of the unexpected, if you will. And um, we should all be all ears in terms of how we are translating ideas into space that we're all occupying because we all have them right now. And we all have an attitude and we all have had some incredible experiences. So. I'd like to just follow up with what you just said. And um, what do you think where our ideas now should come from? What should inspire us in interior design and architecture and landscape design? Well, again, I just sort of see it from um, observations of use, you know, um, and the ability and observations from individuals who are using it. You know, um, I, I and it really gets down to the human condition. Uh, and particularly that's what I'm a bit impassioned about right now, but also science and the neuroscience. I mean, there's so many integrated disciplines right now, you know, interdisciplinary disciplines that are speaking to um, mental health and well-being, um, that are speaking to the power of collaboration, that are speaking to the neurosciences in terms of, um, you know, how we are adapting right now, but some basic human needs that we've been speaking to for a long time. Movement within space as, you know, the, the great example that is continually talked about in terms of creating a healthful environment. So I just think that there's a, a huge array. And, and one of the things that I think, um, I think is really, and I, I, I wish I could be doing more of that, is um, being astute observers, mm -hmm. you know, of like identifying the problem, like what is the single, what is the single worst outcome? What is the worst problem we're trying to deal with right now? And sometimes frame up a problem that way and then let everyone come at it from it. And, you know, sometimes you have to define the worst in order to get to an amazing solution. So, you know, I wish I had the answers. I don't, and I'm all ears. <laughs> I just wanted to um, wrap up our conversation. I know we're kind of getting up on uh, two hours here, but I, I just wanted to, draw um, sort of a comparison between both of you because you both have come from a background um, of a very, very large firms that are doing large work. And both of you are now on a trajectory that um, focuses on um, smaller scale work. And can you tell me a little bit, I, I am not sure that that is at all related to sort of our current condition, but, um, how you see that as sort of your next chapter and and why is that important to our world today? In terms of, well, I, I don't know, I wonder, like the first, the, that Garrett Light Store, the first one I showed, the, at the time, Jai and I were designing, like we were each doing like a 200,000 square foot, 500,000 square foot project. <laughs> and to do that project and spend just the intensity on a thousand square feet as you would 50,000 square feet or whatever. Uh, at that moment in time for me, it was like, wow, this is like, a, you know, how am I, how am I just realizing how cool small things can be? And I, I felt kind of like uh, very naive in that, I guess. 
Um, and I still kind of do um, in terms of just like the comment, again, the comment about the like hand sanitizer thing. How do we do that? You know, like the smallest things I still think uh, are, 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 are big design challenges. And, and, and uh, I don't know, I, I feel like this, this scale of a small design practice for me is exciting. I guess I'm on, I'm on that side more so now because of the nimbleness and the difference of opinion you get. Like we, we usually get on, a, on projects we're working with other architects and other designers and, and almost always hands down, everybody's working together around different problems. And I like that there's not like one master architect on, on big projects. Um, be, because you get such complex spaces out of it and like interactions and there's different design pieces going on. And, and to me, I, I think the small number of firms are able to make room for more of them to come together to kind of create bigger impact. Um, and I, I guess that's how we've seen our, our practice play out on all of our big projects. We, we usually partnered with an architect record, uh, kind of looking at another scale of the project. Um, which has really helped us. Um, we learn from them, they learn from us. We're, we're moving at different speeds, which is really good, uh, but we're all trying to go towards the same goal. And, and I feel like it's, it's opened up uh, a deeper design language about projects when you're trying to not just talk from architect to client, but it's architect to architect, to landscape architect to whoever else. And, and then they're, they're trying to gather a conversation and then to present that. So um, I guess it's like a multiplicity thing for me that this, this scale has been really nice to, uh, try and have a lot of uh, kind of hands playing at it rather than just like one big kind of <laughs> uh, uh, kind of voice in the, in the situation. Mm -hmm. That makes any sense. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, as I, I, I've worked on mega projects too, um, and, and some smaller ones as well. And I just realized, again, as I'm sort of going into my next chapter, the importance of being able to pace a project differently. You know, the importance of building the relationship um, with your user, with your clients. And it's not to say that, you know, um, I haven't, but the idea of actually being able to pace it and the idea of resolve in the detail. And I, and I love, you know, for me, I love a mission-driven project. Um, I'm working on a really interesting project right now that is... Um, a, a district building. And I, I love the idea of being able to um, make a difference. It's our way of sort of making a difference. And for many who have worked on some of these larger projects, sometimes they're seven years out, seven and eight years out. And what I so admire about um, the, the faster tenant improvements, and I, I, I certainly have done a lot of those, um, but to see your work there, Clayton, is the ability to rapidly ideate and rapidly realize something and to do it smarter and smarter. And, and hopefully you have the ability, it's not gonna be scraped away and uh, thrown into a, a, a dump. You have the ability to be reusing those sorts of things and the idea of just applying a, a different sort of approach altogether that's sat so process heavy. And so for me, the idea of freedom of um, a process heavy, which is required when you're dealing with complex projects that are you know, that are as large and as, um, you know, important as they are, but the idea of really being able to experiment as well and experiment with that process. But for me, ultimately, um, I have found that my favorite projects are the pages I am just in love with that I can't stop thinking about and the outcomes are always there. And it's always where you have a relationship with that client for the most part. Um, and so the, having the passion around the work that you're doing, and for me, I think um, realistically, it's on that smaller scale. Now, admittedly, I've, I, I do get called in to do some consulting and to, you know, to do some peer review as such. And that's great as well. But, you know, but for me, it's, it's going to be small from here on in. And I can't wait to have an opportunity to pace a project in a meaningful way. Yeah. There sure is the time to do it now too, right? <laughs> both so much for your time, for sharing your work with us and your experience mm -hmm. and your thoughts. And um, thank you to all the students here as well. I loved your questions very much and um, looking forward to seeing what um, comes next for both of you. <laughs>